In this video, let's talk about Blackmagic's new Ursa Cine Immersive. You're watching VP Land. Special thanks to our sponsors, Blackmagic, View, and LucidLink for helping make our NAB coverage possible. And now, back to the video. So, tell me what we got going on here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, here we're demonstrating our uh, new Ursa Cine Immersive camera mm. and the entire workflow that goes along with it. Okay, uh, and so let's start with the camera. Can you walk me through some of the, uh, the specs and what we're looking at with the, uh, the lens system here? Absolutely, yeah. So the Ursa Cine Immersive is basically the same thing as our Ursa 12K LF from here back. Mm -hmm. It's the same camera entirely. Okay. The difference starts at the sensors where we actually have two of the 12K sensors. Okay, so it is not the 17K camera, it's the two 12K sensors. That's right, two okay. discrete 12K sensors, and we're capturing a circular fisheye image, so you're getting effectively 8K per eye out okay. of that. Okay, and what are these, uh, what is the lens up here? Yeah, so the lens is a custom fixed focused, fixed iris lens um, that is seeing over 180 degrees field of view. And then for delivery, it crops down to 180 degrees. Okay. And so when you're filming, what is this process like and how is that different than if you're just filming a regular traditional? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so there, there are some things you'd want to do differently in terms of how you compose a shot, how you move the camera and whatnot. So generally, uh, the camera is a really good analog to your perspective on the world. So if we're having a conversation here, the camera's maybe gonna be placed just below my eye level. So we have, mm. you know, kind of a, a realistic perspective on this conversation. So that's one thing. Your viewer in the headset is actually uh, panning and tilting their head. So you actually leave the camera static and level. Mm -hmm. um, so that's essential. You don't pan, you don't tilt necessarily. Mm -hmm. And if you do move the camera, which camera moves can look really good, you generally want to limit it to one or two axes of movement. Once uh -huh. you start to like kind of crab the camera, it can be a little bit discomforting for the for the viewer. Uh, okay. So things but like that, that. Yeah. Yeah. And then what are we looking at in this? Um, viewfinder here and kind of how is that different than our traditional viewfinder yeah so absolutely so on the viewfinder here you're seeing uh one of the eyes from the camera so in terms of what we have going on on the screen here uh this outer circle represents the 180 degree field of view of the lenses and then the inner box represents your rough field of view in the headset mm -hmm. so that's really useful for framing up your shot and figuring out how large the character is going to appear in the frame. Okay. We have some controls along the left side. This L and R button lets you switch between the eyes for preview purposes. Um, the plus button there, the, that lets you punch in okay. to that center area, that center kind of field of view. Yep. And then this, there we go, this final box lets you turn off those overlays. Okay. So that's the main difference. All the other controls within the camera are really similar to our other cameras. Mm -hmm. Our menu system is consistent on this camera like the others. So it's a real mm -hmm. simple camera to operate. Okay. Uh, and then what are the different considerations around uh, focusing mm -hmm. or like aligning, like what the eye should be kind of uh, dialed in on? Yeah, absolutely. So these lenses are fixed focus and mm -hmm. they've been set to be able to focus from about a meter away all the way to infinity. Okay. Um, so it keeps everything in focus and then it slowly falls off as you get closer to the camera from there. Okay. So you're really just kind of framing the shot that's and right. exposure and then rolling. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's about putting the viewer in a new location mm -hmm. and they have the, um, the control about where they're looking in that scene. Right. Okay. Um, and then we're recording Blackmagic RAW. How is this a, because it's two sensors, is it recording its own special Blackmagic RAW file or two files? How does that, how does yeah, that work? Yeah, so, so it's a single Blackmagic RAW file and the codec is going to get extended okay. uh, in order to allow both the left and right layer to be captured in the same file. Um, there's a couple key differences. Uh, one is these lenses are calibrated to the sensors in the factory, and that calibration lives in that Blackmagic RAW file all the way through the post pipeline. Okay. Um, and that allows us to unwrap the lenses accurately in the headset, so there's really very little post process, which we can talk about in a minute. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we can go, unless there's anything about, else about the camera, we can yeah, talk. Maybe yeah, maybe two other things yeah, yeah, important yeah. to note. Because it's a fixed iris lens, mm -hmm. um, the way you control exposure is through ISO, shutter angle, and multiple stops of ND filters. So we have two, okay. four, six, and eight stops of ND built in. 
Okay, yeah. okay, so fix of that is your exposure control. That's right. And uh, I think the last thing to yeah. talk about is we're capturing 8K um, with our full 16 stops of dynamic range per eye at 90 frames a second. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the high spec that we worked on Apple with uh, in order to deliver the best content to the Vision okay. Pro. I'm just going to ask, but I feel like you'd want to lock it at 8K, 90 frames per second, but can you adjust that lower if there's any need to? But I'm not quite sure what the... Yeah, you can shoot at a lower be. frame rate. Uh -huh. um, for delivery to the Apple Vision Pro, their spec is 90 um, frames a second, um, but it is possible to have uh, okay. different so, settings. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, and then shoot, camera, next step of the process. Absolutely, yeah. So. Kind of one thing to keep in mind about this process is we're shooting in lens space. And what that means is we're shooting in that circular fisheye mm -hmm. space. Uh, we're also editing in lens space. So okay. we're editing a circular fisheye image and then we're delivering that to the headset. So the image is actually unwrapped in the headset as opposed to unwrapping it at the editorial phase. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually a much more efficient pipeline and maintains the fidelity all the way through to the process to the uh, headset. Is there a way to preview in the headset, either in the camera stage or in Resolve? Yeah, so we're looking at in headset preview from the camera mm -hmm. on set. Uh, that's still TBD, but okay. we're hopeful that's, that's going to get implemented. And then in terms of in Resolve, yes, you can absolutely uh, preview in the headset. Um, you go to your workspace and then stream to Vision OS, and that will allow you to stream your okay. edit or your color page okay. result to the Vision OS. And then what else uh, is unique once we're in here in Resolve that's specific for dealing with um, immersive video? Yeah, absolutely. When you're first setting up your project, uh, in project settings, you'll find a checkbox that is enable pro immersive workflow. Okay. And if you enable that, then it's going to turn on certain features for this project. Um, and then when you import your clips, you'll see they come in with a little 3D tag. Mm -hmm. And that's a Blackmagic RAW file that has both a left and a right eye uh -huh. in that same file. So from that point on, you would edit uh, as normal. Um, and then we'd go to the color page, where the big difference on the color page is you do your normal color mm -hmm. correction, but you also have this 3D panel. So that allows you to switch between your left and your right eye for preview purposes. Or let's say you're at a concert and like a, uh, a spotlight hit one lens uh, and you need a balance between the eyes a bit. Okay. Uh, you can actually unlink uh, this option here and that allows me to adjust just one eye slightly. Okay, uh, but everything else in the color page when you're doing the adjustments, that's applying to both left and right. That's right. At the same time. Okay. That's right. One hundred percent. And there's going to be uh, additional immersive capable features coming online over time. Uh, we've got kind of an initial feature set to be able to do some basic edits and deliver it to the Vision OS. Okay. What yeah. are the, some of the other features that? Uh, yeah. So coming? certain things like um, how we're handling transitions and titles mm. and how we're passing that metadata through to the Vision OS to actually render them live on the headset. Okay. That's something that's going to be coming down the pipe. Um, how we're handling power windows between the two eyes, mm. how you can do visual effects on the fusion page in this lens space. So these are all things okay. that we're, you know, we have planned to do, uh -huh. but aren't in this version that we're showing today. Okay. Um, is there any workflow right now, uh, like with fusion or something like adding text that fits inside the 3D space? Uh, there will be in very short order, okay. uh, just not in the version we're showing today. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then what other uh, kind of considerations? Like I was thinking even last year uh, with Resolve when the, uh, with IntelliTrack mm -hmm. with uh, audio mixing. Yeah. And then it seemed like, oh, that seems like that would fit with something that's more immersive. So is that, uh, are there other kind of tool sets in here too to like bring the full um, Apple immersive video experience uh, yeah, to the deliverable? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. I mean, on the Fairlight page, we already have ambisonic mixing up mm -hmm. to uh, fifth order ambisonics. Mm -hmm. And so that tool set, we're obviously going to adapt to this immersive lens space workflow mm -hmm. um, with the heat maps and the tracking and whatnot. Uh, it's all kind of part of the plan to be able to create a whole post-production pipeline that's seamless to the editor and the audio mixer and the visual effects artist and really take immersive content creation from a science project to more of just a normal video production pipeline. Yeah, and yeah, how does this compare to other methods where you, when you're trying to do immersive video in the past or have two cameras yeah. or stereoscopic kind of system? Yeah, there's a lot of steps in the old ways of producing immersive content. Uh, you have to do stereo alignment, you have to map from lens space to equirectangular, um, and you have to do a lot of corrections all along the way, whether it's syncing or you know, correction between the eyes. 
the goal here is to make most of that invisible to the user. So really there's almost no additional steps as compared to a, a traditional video production pipeline. Mm -hmm. Straight on the camera, bringing the footage. That's right, yeah, and, a, and a big part of that is that lens space workflow. Mm -hmm. like with, the, with the echo rectangular workflow, you're actually wasting a lot of pixels and compressing a lot of pixels in the final render that are unnecessary. So if you think of like a world map, Mm -hmm. how you stretch everything out and you have Greenland up at the top of the map and it's really yeah. large, it's using a lot of pixels. Those are kind of wasted pixels. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you leave things in lens space, you can be much more efficient with okay. the codec. Okay, okay, yeah. And I know I know this was sort of designed specifically for a mass Apple immersive, the video, Apple Vision Pro and immersive video, mm -hmm. uh, but do you see other applications uh, with this for either headsets or uh, spherical displays? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we're definitely concentrating right now on making sure this workflow is kind of rock solid mm -hmm. and lets content creators make uh, material very quickly. But we know that people are going to want to, you know, produce content for other platforms as well. And so we're excited to see what creators do with it. Yeah. Uh, and I know we're on the uh, DIT card here. So mm -hmm. are there additional, like, what, like what else has been demoed or workflow considerations? Yeah, so this, this uh, DIT card, this basically is is giving us all sorts of different options for kind of a high level production. So we have our media dock here where you take the media from the camera and you load it into the dock to offload. And so that's kind of an essential feature of, of a production. You can also offload from the camera, but this method lets you keep shooting with that camera, obviously. So if I put this camera into record here, nope, there we go, we're mounted. It actually triggers this deck to record as well. So. Okay. Because that deck is recording, I can play back from this card while the camera goes and sets up uh, for another shot. So those kind okay. of features really kind of help augment a larger production. So and is it just kind of recording the preview we see here? Yeah, it's, it's record, your... recording the SDI out. Okay. Um, and is that, I guess, you could control what, if you have just the spherical image or if you have the uh, overlays? It's the... really about kind of performance playback. Uh -huh. um, so on this card, we're... We have a full switcher, so we can route these signals okay. anywhere to set. So there's a lot of distribution points on the back of the card. So okay. we can feed video to Video Village, to hair and makeup, and to uh -huh. anybody else that needs it. And so that's the idea here. This has a lot of components and a lot of capability, mm -hmm. um, but it can be right size for any production, really. Right. You don't have to have all these components for, for your show. Okay. And then back at Resolve. Yeah. Uh, we're finished, what's the uh, kind of export process and, and media format? Sure, uh, yeah, the final like? stage of the process yeah. is you go to the delivery page, and the delivery page along the top here, we've had these uh, presets for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, and now we have a render preset for Vision OS. Okay. So you select that, it sets the optimum settings, and then you export, and once it's exported to your desktop or wherever you're rendering it to, you would use the Apple Immersive Utility, which just came out a day or two ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and this allows you to either play content from uh, the uh, computer directly to the headset, okay. uh, or you could do a 2D playback of that material here and pan around, uh, or you can fully sideload it and download it to the headset to playback later. Okay. So it's kind of a central part of the utility for everybody's kind of post-production yeah. process. I remember when Apple came out with this, they sort of had two distinctions where they had the Apple immersive video. Mm -hmm. And originally that was sort of their kind of like marquee original productions they were doing. Uh, and then they had the spatial video. Right. That was wait, uh, MVHEVC, which you could shoot on your phone. Mm -hmm. What are the differences uh, in these two formats? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so so it's interesting. Yeah, so traditional video is just 2D video. Uh, spatial video is a, a type of stereoscopic video. Mm -hmm. So it's normally shot with normal rectilinear lenses, mm -hmm. uh, a ver variety of focal lengths. And then immersive video is truly intended to be, you know, 180 degrees, mm -hmm. your human kind of perspective on the world. Um, so you're not shooting with longer lenses necessarily. Uh -huh. um, and so those are kind of distinct formats within the platform, though depending on what the creator wants to do, they have been mixing and matching a bit uh, uh, okay. within the so yeah, immersive you, productions. I guess, is that possible? Or have you, like, if you did shoot with the Cine Immersive, but then also had some spatial video shot with an iPhone or something, yeah. would that, could that be cut, uh, cut together? Yeah, I would, I would say it can, yeah. Uh -huh. and, and on the Apple Vision Pro platform, we've seen some examples, mm -hmm. like Submerged has some close-up shots that mm -hmm. are shot with, let's say, probably a beam splitter or side-by-side -side rig mm -hmm. to get 
um, kind of a more intimate uh, capture of that character and just it was right for that particular moment. So, yeah, we've seen that already in some productions and we're going to support a form of that for sure. Okay. For all. But kind of the Apple immersive video label is like more like it meets the the, uh, the higher spec standards, mm -hmm. like 90 frames per second, That's right. 8K resolution. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, 8K source, 90 frames per mm -hmm. second, recording in uh, in a raw codec uh, and finishing uh, with this workflow where you have all this rich metadata that gets delivered to the headset. Those are kind of the okay. three essential components. Okay. Um, are there any of the Apple Immersive videos out now that uh, were shot with the Cine Immersive? So nothing on platform yet that's okay. been shot with the Cine Immersive. It's all... Uh, well, most of it's used Apple's uh, proprietary camera that actually mm. used some of our older sensor technology. Okay. So anything you see now is mm -hmm. with the newer sensor, and so it's going to look even better than what you've seen on the platform already. Cool. Well, thank you so much for the update. Really yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. My thank pleasure. You. And that is it for this video. Thanks again to our sponsors for helping make our NAB coverage possible. And for more of our NAB videos, be sure to check out the playlist right here. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next episode.